much of the work in this area is uh, attributed to uh, uh, William House and uh, Ugo Fish. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, these are, we're going to just talk about um, approaches through the temp temporal bone. We'll review relevant anatomy, surgical techniques, indications, uh, variations, and uh, include a few case examples along the way. So, um, a neurologic uh, access to the petrous bone involves four main uh, approaches related to four surfaces of the uh, petrous pyramid. Uh, lateral, superior, inferior, and uh, posterior. The focus of this talk is on the lateral, the transmastic approach. Um, we'll review the briefly the retrolabyrinthine approach. Uh, transcrucial, as uh, James uh, mentioned before, partial labyrinthectomy, uh, translabyrinthine, transodic, uh, transcochlear, some variations uh, by Marosana, and then uh, uh, I, inclu I included also some petrous apex uh, drainage procedures that are fairly common. So uh, retro labyrinthine approach, um, otherwise known as a posterior petrosectomy, includes uh, mastoidectomy, uh, skeletonization of the posterior fossa dura, uh, and the uh, labyrinth, and then opening of the posterior fossa dura uh, to approach uh, the cerebral pontine angle. <clears throat> um, can be used in the it's been used in the past for trigeminal. Uh, nerve uh, uh, procedures as well as vestibular nerve section and uh, to uh, biopsy uh, cerebral uh, pontine, uh, pontine angle uh, lesions. Uh, kind of one of the key things with this approach is uh, the closure um, and uh, it can be, uh, uh, it's just something that should be studied before the operation. Generally when I do it, we'll place a, uh, a, uh, a dry fascial graft over the antrum uh, into the middle ear space and then uh, cover it with a piece of bone followed by fat uh, in the closure. So then there's the transcrucial approach, uh, as James mentioned before, or otherwise known as partial labyrinthectomy. It uh, can be done as uh, a, por a part of a petrosal approach uh, to gain additional exposure to the cerebral, cerebral ponting uh, angle. It's interesting that you can preserve hearing uh, in approximately 60% uh, of patients uh, well, with this approach. Uh, then there's the translab approach, which we're all relatively uh, familiar with. Uh, it's excellent access for patients uh, with uh, poor or absent hearing in whom uh, hear, uh, preservation of hearing, or patients in whom preservation of hearing is not a high uh, priority. <clears throat> it begins with the mastoidectomy uh, and uh, uh, the uh, landmarks of which uh, we covered on Monday, uh, exposure of the uh, semicircular canals and uh, uh, skeletonization of the vertical segment of, of the facial nerve, uh, and then we begin the labyrinthectomy. Um, generally, I'll start the labyrinthectomy by identifying the uh, lateral semicircular canal by bivalving it uh, or just opening it to positively identify it, uh, and then proceed to the posterior semicircular canal, open it, follow that into the common cruise, and then open the uh, um, uh, bone overlying the superior canal where you'll find the uh, the uh, arcuate, uh, sorry, subarcuate uh, artery, uh, which is actually a good landmark uh, for the, the uh, internal auditory canal. If you stay above the subarcuate artery, you're going to stay out of the internal auditory canal. Uh, once uh, the labyrinthectomy is done, uh, my next move is generally to go to the uh, inferior trough, identify the jugular bulb and the inferior aspect of the internal auditory canal. It's there that you'll find the uh, cochlear aqueduct. Uh, which is uh, shown here by Jackler. Uh, the cochlear aqueduct is a, actually a good landmark to keep you out of the uh, lower cranial nerves. As you know, the cochlear aqueduct uh, starts just on top of the jugular frame and then heads to the basal turn of the cochlea. Uh, and because it's right at the top of the jugular frame, and uh, we can use that as a landmark to stay out of the lower cranial nerves. Uh, when the cochlear aqueduct is patent, uh, the, you'll see the transgress of cerebral spinal fluid into your uh, into your wound, and that will uh, result into, relax, into the uh, early re relaxation of the, of the patient's uh, brain, and that promotes uh, tumor removal. After uh, that inferior trough is opened, uh, we skeletonize the uh, medial aspect of the internal auditory canal, head into the superior aspect of the internal auditory canal, and then uh, there's further dissection of the uh, internal auditory canal out to the fundus. Um, then the dura is opened, and uh, tumor removal uh, commences. <clears throat> uh, important considerations when choosing this approach include uh, whether the uh, status is what the status of the patient's mastoid is. It's uh, it's very difficult uh, to use this. It can be more difficult to use this approach when the patient's mastoid is 
uh, sclerose from a history of chronic ear disease. Uh, so uh, I'll favor a retrosigmoid in, that, in those cases. Uh, another thing to take into consideration is the height of the jugular bulb. Um, you can lower the jugular bulb. We do lower the jugular bulb. There's a um, number of papers about lowering the jugular bulb, but if, uh, if it's going to be in play, it's just something to take into consideration in choosing your approach for these patients. Um, <clears throat> it offers uh, visualiz visualization of the uh, facial nerve uh, laterally or early, early on. That's a, a benefit of this approach over retrosig. Uh, tumor, tumor removal in the fundus is, is, is absolutely easier. Um, but it can, you can remove a tumor from the fundus in a non-hearing preservation case with a retrosigmoid approach as well with proper bone removal via that approach. Uh, the working distance is shorter, uh, which is a benefit. And uh, there is also the benefit of uh, little or no uh, retraction of the cerebellum. <clears throat> the mantra is remove the bone and uh, leave the brain alone. Um, the, the poster fossa exposure is variable and it can be tailored uh, based on the tumor uh, that you uh, need uh, to remove. And so we'll study the uh, preoperative uh, imaging and just kind of decide on what we need to do. And, and sometimes with a smaller tumor, that'll move the case along a little bit more quickly. So it can be used in very large tumors, as James was showing us in, in our experience as well. We were able to remove this uh, um, large tumor in a young uh, male uh, that had NF2 uh, completely. Uh, the, uh, the next approach is the transodic, which was uh, developed by Ugo Fish. Um, and uh, originally, uh, uh, he, his intention was to use this for uh, 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 smaller tumors, small to medium sized tumors, less than 2.5 centimeter. Uh, the uh, difference between this and, um, uh, and the trans lab approach is that the ear canal is removed and uh, you open the, uh, you remove the inner ear and uh, the labyrinth. Uh, this picture is from Marosana's atlas. Um, the uh, uh, ear canal is removed so that uh, you go ahead and uh, close the extra auditory canal. Um, and uh, then essentially the facial nerve is uh, barber pulled in the, in the mastoid segment um, and you follow it out. Um, you can, you, the genically it stays in place. The facial nerve is not rerouted and then you can follow it into the uh, internal auditory canal. Um, I find this uh, approach most useful when you have lesions that involve both the inner ear and then the cerebral pontine angle of the internal auditory canal. Um, it's uh, kind of a go-to for, for us uh, when those uh, uh, rare situations arise. Most recently we had a lady with uh, a intra uh, cochlear, uh, in intra labyrinthine and internal auditory canal uh, recurrence of a previously operated uh, middle fossa uh, vestibular schwannoma we removed successfully with this approach. Um, and other indications to use it is, uh, are when you have a, a high jugular bulb or an anterior sigmoid sinus and you want to go through a tent transtemporal route. Um, and uh, it also, um, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Transcochlear approach uh, was developed by House um, and William House in 1976. Um, again, here we are, uh, it's uh, closing the external auditory canal similar to the, uh, the transodic approach. Um, this is a removal of the uh, inner ear and uh, uh, removal of the external auditory canal. And then uh, the big difference here with the transrotic approach is the posterior rerouting of the uh, facial nerve, <clears throat> which is a big disadvantage uh, of this approach uh, because it ca can cause a permanent uh, facial paralysis. Most patients end up with, uh, I, I guess, with a House Brackman uh, grade uh, two. Uh, so it's unusual to use this approach, but occasionally it's indicated uh, for the appropriate, uh, in the appropriate case. Um, uh, one advantage of this over a trans lab is the exposure of the eustachian tube. So sometimes this is actually uh, a go-to approach uh, uh, when patients have a persistent cerebral spinal fluid leak. This gives you direct access to the eustachian uh, tube for, for closure. This is his original paper in uh, 1976, which was published in the archives of uh, otolaryngology on that, on that approach. Um, uh, Robert Jackler looked at uh, these approaches for us in uh, 1995 and published a paper uh, dividing up uh, various uh, trans uh, temporal approaches and uh, divided them uh, based on zones, which is uh, similar to uh, what James was mentioning earlier about the zones that uh, Marcos uh, likes to use uh, for uh, tr trying to pick the appropriate approach. But most of these trans temporal approaches really just give you access to uh, zone two. Uh, the ponds and the pontomedullary junction, but he uh, points out that you, know, you can combine these with uh, various approaches 
um, uh, to gain access to uh, lesions in um, zone one and two or zone uh, two and three as we've been seeing through multiple different lectures uh, today. So this was clarified in 1998 by uh, Mario Sana with his uh, system of uh, modified transcochlear approaches uh, to the central skull base. And uh, he reviews the transcochlear approach, which he calls the transcochlear type A, which is Bill Bell House's uh, uh, approach from 1976. So you can use that for a wide variety of lesions uh, uh, of the, uh, the uh, central skull base. Uh, but he, he has a, uh, a type B, which is anterior extension, uh, that incorporates uh, the uh, uh, Bill House's uh, transcochlear approach type A with a fish. Uh, fish type A approach, I'm uh, sorry, fish type uh, B approach uh, for wide exposure of the uh, infratemporal fossa uh, with a, addition, the addition of exposure, of, uh, additional exposure for anterior medial tumors lying ventral to the brain stem and extra dural uh, tumors with uh, circumferential involvement of the carotid artery. Type C is uh, with su superior extension, so it's a combination of a transcochlear uh, with the middle fossa approach. Uh, you cut the tentorium, and as we've heard earlier today, we need to keep in mind the trochlear nerve. Uh, but this also uh, puts the vein of Lebe at risk. Uh, it gives you uh, control of both infratentorial and supratentorial uh, parts of the tumor, ventral to the pons or midbrain, with uh, minimal temporal lobe retraction. Uh, he has uh, uh, offered us this uh, illustration um, of the transcochlear approach uh, type uh, C with superior extension, uh, which uh, shows us the type of exposure you can get uh, with the, combina the combination of approaches. You can see the internal carotid artery, fifth cranial nerve, uh, third cranial nerve, fourth cranial nerves, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, type D incorporates uh, what he calls a POTS or a petro-occipital transsigmoid approach, uh, which is where the sigmoid sinus is extraluminally closed and uh, at the uh, sigmoid transverse junction and the internal artery, uh, internal uh, jugular vein is closed as well, and it's uh, useful for lower brainstem, clivus, and jugular frame and lesions. Infratemporal fossa approaches uh, were, um, uh, <coughs> uh, again, um, um, uh, have been, were developed by Fish. The original was a type A. More anterior exposure is offered by type B and type C. Uh, it gives us, they give us access to the jugular frame and um, mandibular fossa, uh, posterior infratemporal fossa. Um, the, uh, in the classic infratemporal fossa approach, the external auditory canal is closed and uh, there's uh, anterior, anterior rerouting of the, uh, of the facial nerve uh, where the facial nerve is decompressed uh, here in its vertical segment and then at the second genu all the way up to the geniculate ganglion. And when we do this, when we use this approach, I'm not doing that currently, but um, in the classic approach, you would uh, the uh, fibrous tissue at the lo located at the level of the stylomastoid foramen can be sutured to the fascia of the parotid to hold it uh, throughout the case. Um, what we're using is more of the uh, fallopian uh, bridge technique, sort of, uh, but or it's just partial rerouting of the vertical segment of the of the uh, uh, facial nerve. So I guess not the fallopian bridge technique. Um, whether we're closing the ear canal or we're uh, doing a hearing preservation approach uh, for these jugular, jugular frame and tumors. Uh, what I've been doing is just uh, partially rerouting the vertical segment of the facial nerve, and then it gives you enough access to the jugular frame in here to remove the tumors in that area. <coughs> um, the key, one of the key, so the general steps of that approach are overclosure of the external auditory canal, mastoidectomy, preparation of the neck, identification of the lower cranial nerves in the neck, transposition of the facial nerve, if you choose to do that, tumor removal, and then closure. But uh, what one of the key, uh, most painful parts of that operation is closure of the, closure of the external auditory canal. And I was talking to Raphael about that on uh, Monday, so I wanted to show uh, some pictures of that. It's, uh, it's, you, it's important to be meticulous about this can be, because it can be a source of uh, complications uh, for these patients. Um, so you just uh, take your time in the beginning of the procedure uh, we uh, uh, basically get the flap elevated, turn the ear forward, and then just carefully remove all the cartilage uh, from the uh, skin of the external auditory canal. And then I'll, I'll do it just like it's shown in this picture. I think this is from one of Brackman's texts. Um, with, uh, I'll just put some uh, 
to a Vico suture there and then snap it and then pull the snaps through, ex, um, pull the external canal through like a, uh, a sock and then um, go ahead and over sew it uh, with some nylon and then you put a second layer of closure um, on the, uh, with the soft tissue of the, uh, 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 from the posterior aspect of the wound uh, over this area with some tool of Vicryl. <clears throat> Uh, so then there's uh, Petri Safex deep drainage procedures, infracochlear, infralabyrinthine. So uh, I figured I'd go ahead and mention them as uh, well to include them in this talk. Um, the just quick, briefly, infracochlear approach can be done through a transcanal or postfericular incision. Uh, but either way, uh, you gain access uh, to the uh, hypotympanum. And generally speaking, the first thing you're going to want to uh, do is find the jugular bulb uh, and then um, identify the round window. Uh, membrane and that'll keep you out of the uh, lower edge of the cochlea and then you proceed medially. Um, if you have a patient with a uh, hypopneumatized uh, temporal bone, it's a good idea, or sclerosis temporal bone, it's a good idea to do this with stereotech neuronavigation. If it's a hypernumatized temporal bone, it's easy uh, to do. You can usually generally you could pop into a large cholesterol granuloma through, through that approach. Um, it's not my favorite approach uh, for these lesions because of the proximity to the carotid artery. I prefer the infralabatine approach which is an older uh, approach. Um, it generally starts with a mastoidectomy and then uh, you work through that infralabyrinthine retrofacial aerosol tract uh, towards the uh, posterior petrous apex. And if the cholesterol granuloma is involving that area, uh, you'll go ahead and drain it. So I'll end with a, a, a case. Uh, this is a patient that with a large cholesterol granuloma, is approximately four centimeters. <clears throat> this patient um, was treated at our institution, uh, I think within the last couple of years. Uh, he uh, originally presented um, in uh, the night, late 1990s uh, to an outside uh, uh, physician and underwent an uh, extradural uh, uh, subtemporal approach uh, for excision of his lesion and it recurred. He presented us with uh, abducens, palsy, and a facial paralysis. Um, so we talked to him about his various options. He actually has poor hearing in his, his left ear, sorry, his right ear as well. Um, but we talked to him about his options and then took a look at the scans and on his uh, CT uh, you can see a, a reasonable uh, path on the actual CT to his uh, cholesterol granuloma. And on a Stenberg's Stenberg view, which is a uh, basically that's a view uh, in the plane of the posterior semicircular canal, which is not shown in either of these pictures, but if you just take my word for it, the, the, the plane is right along here, right along this uh, yellow line. Uh, it shows us a reasonable path inferior to the uh, patient's internal auditory canal labyrinth um, through that infralabyrinthine approach. So we just figured it'd be um, easy for the patient to have that procedure done and uh, hopefully reduce his symptoms. So here's a little video of that infralabyrinthine approach uh, for uh, this particular patient. Um, mastoidectomy is done and uh, uh, you could, that's, we opened up into his, uh, uh, in, into his uh, cholesterol granuloma right there. You can see the vertic uh, vertical segment of the facial nerve posterior canal. This is a scope uh, we inserted into the uh, patient's lesion just uh, to, for, for a look afterwards. You can see the pulsations of the posterior fossa uh, dura there. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, that's the same video. Uh, we went ahead and put a stent. This is a frontal sinus a stent that's used in sinus uh, surgery in uh, the opening to keep the uh, keep that area open. Um, and uh, next next slide shows a stent on uh, postoperative CT scan in this uh, petrous apex. Um, and here's his postoperative MRI. Uh, you can see re a resolution of the uh, cholesterol granuloma on the postop MRI there. Um, he, uh, uh, the abducens palsy uh, cleared and his facial paralysis uh, was uh, persistent as most recent follow-up. I haven't seen him in a while. Um, anyways, in conclusion, complex anatomy in this region, region necessitates a thorough understanding. Uh, the nomenclature is diverse and can be problematic, especially in teaching institutions. Um, we should have a knowledge of our and, and flexibility to indiv individualize our approach uh, for each patient. Uh, thank you.